Welcome to any replayers. If you are a replayer, you can, of course, participate by tapping on the screen for hearts, especially if I say anything that's at all relevant to you or helped you with your knowledge. And uh, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Joanna Zarek or on Snapchat at Joanna Zarek. You can ask me questions there uh, or interact in any way you need. You can ask me questions regarding this broadcast or anything that you may be struggling with in your personal financial life. I am happy to answer your questions. Okay. For those of you joining live, and if you are new to me, I want to do a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Joanna Zarek, and I am um, only here to talk about money. So I think that our financial literacy is uh, fairly low, and our understanding of uh, a general understanding of finances is not something that's very pervasive. And so what I want to do is rectify the situation. So I have been um, interested in personal finance all my life. It's not what I do for a living, by the way. I'm a management consultant. Uh, but I have been interested in uh, investing, taxation, just as a participant in the financial system. And uh, over the last three years, I've really doubled down and, and thought deeply about money and, and finances and looked around and wondered why isn't like everyone on on my money train. <laughs> so why hasn't why aren't other people participating fully in what I think is a very you know robust economy, uh, not just as workers but also as investors and as people to build wealth. So I've decided to um, step outside into the world since October and talk about what I know and share my knowledge with everybody else. So um, I do two things, two types of broadcasts. I do a daily money habits broadcast at 10 a.m. Central Time, because that's in Chicago. And I do that seven days a week. And I really want people to get in the habit of managing their money. And uh, the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you get. It's like any skill, you need to really flex your muscle and develop that, um, that skill. The uh, Money Matters broadcast, and so you're on the Money Matters broadcast. I do that twice a week. I started in January at the beginning of the year. I do a Tuesday and Friday, 5 p.m. Central Money Matters broadcast. And I basically dive deeper on a financial topic. I've covered things like um, you know, credit and use of credit, taxation, you know, how tax rates impact you, uh, various um, you know, retirement planning, uh, like explanation of IRAs and 401ks, et cetera, et cetera, alternative investments. So I talk about a variety of the, these things. If you're interested, I do have a Catch.me account, and, and some of those videos are, are there, I believe. I, I haven't gone and rewatched that many of them. And uh, at some point, I'm going to start recycling it, because money is not as complicated as we think, and you really need to take a few steps to move yourself forward. So um, today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, becoming an investor. So one of the things that I really want to see everyone become is not just a consumer, um, that's a given, is not just a worker, this is participating in our economy. You know, there's the various ways in which you can do it. So uh, people are workers, uh, people may have benefits if they are not able to work. We're all consumers, right? We participate in the economy. And um, a few people are investors. And I think if more people became investors, they would ha change their relationship with money. And now um, the reason why I think it's really important for people to become investors, because it gives your money a different purpose than to spend it. A lot of people, if given the question of, you know, what would you do with an extra $100,000, they go and they kind of make their mental list of where they would spend it. And I want people to really get out of that mindset of consumerism and just getting bigger, more things, bigger things, like a bigger house or a bigger car, newer this, newer that, best, best, best. Uh, stop pursuing the best thing. Uh, and then a look at money as, some, as, a, as something, you can buy something more than things. And the thing that I'm trying to sell is freedom. And I want you guys to understand that in, through investing, you can achieve that. You can achieve freedom for yourself if you wanted to start a business, if you wanted to uh, switch careers, if you wanted to have more free time, if you want to purchase services, uh, enjoy life, and the freedom for your family, that you can achieve that through investing. Now, investing is not for, for everybody, I guess, because not everybody's doing it. Uh, but I do want to talk about the different stages. Uh, so the thing is that when people think about investing, they get overwhelmed because they really don't know where to get started. And there really that there isn't like um, if people around you aren't investors, you are also like not 
able to ask people, like, how do you get started? The other thing is that in our society, money is very taboo. So people don't uh, even, uh, so people don't even talk about it, right? Like it's it's not just, it's not a topic of conversation. So people aren't like, oh, how is your, you know, what what do you pick for your 401ks? We feel like, oh, that's private. And it shouldn't really be, um, yeah, I don't, I only got what you put, so sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, then you can do, um, so what I want to be for you to first understand is evaluate yourself and see where am I in the stage of investing. So some of the things would be relevant and some of the things are not. Why? Because I think people worry about things that don't apply to them uh, when trying to make a decision that seems like complicated. And a lot of times advice is given that's not applicable. So people don't end up taking the right path because they're following advice that people from like up high are giving or people who only deal with wealth management. Like wealth managers are really horrible at giving investing advice to people who've never invested because they're like, oh, well, these are the, you know, or, or they, they say you, have, you, need to all these, you need all these professionals to make the right investing advice. So here's, so here's, let me just go through the stages and talk about what you need to focus on. So what I'm finding more and more, and perhaps you're in this stage, um, is that a lot of people are in what I call a pre-investing stage. I call it pre-investing because I want you to become an investor <laughs> and you may be in a pre-investing stage. How do you know if you're in the pre-investing stage? Well, the first uh, sign would be that you have poor cash flow management. That's my friendly euphemism for you suck at, at, at keeping money or you're spending more than you earn. Um, so, but we'll call it poor cash flow management, which means you don't know where money's coming from, or actually most people know how much their paycheck is. Most of the time the issue is they don't know where it's going. So poor cash flow, or cash flow management is that you just like, money's just going places and you're like every, every month you're like, surprise, money's gone. Um, you really don't have a concept around, you don't have control over your money. So please listen to my money habits broadcast every day because that's what it focuses on. It focuses on you developing better money habits by, tr by basically looking, ap looking after your money. Um, you also need to eliminate your debt. So that's the things, the two things you need to focus when you are in pre-investing stage. And that it means that you're not really an investor yet. Maybe you sign up for a 401k and you're putting like 1%. Someone says you should put some. You're in the pre-investing stage. So two things you focus on is cash flow management. So start paying attention to your money. I always recommend mint.com. It is the most reliable software. It's free. It's web-based. It's on there. It's the most reliable one. It's not going away because it's owned by Intuit. Those are like, the, the, that's a company that's not going out of style or not going out of business. And so I've been using Mint for like six years. Uh, most personal finance bloggers, when asked like, what's our top tools, Mint's number one. Uh, or it's right up there. So get your cash flow under control. And then the next thing is you need to do debt elimination. Um, as an investor, as someone who's been investing for 20 years, um, your expected rate of return for the market, which is where most people invest, is about 8%. If you have, you have to assess your li all, your, all, all your liabilities. And you have, if you have double digit debt, that's credit card debt, because most credit cards, if you're paying interest on them, are double digits. Stop. Stop. Don't think about investing for another minute till you eliminate all double digit debt because no amount of investment will get you a return better than what you're paying, what you're losing on, in interest on credit cards. You have got to get in the mentality that credit card money, borrowed money through, that's unsecured loans is the most expensive money that you can ever get. It's not free money because you didn't earn it, <laughs> it's extremely expensive. That is like, if you can't, if you can't internalize that, it's going to be really, really tough for you to become an investor, effective investor, uh, because like you money's going to interest. Um, so that's, that's number one pre-investing stage, get your cash flow under control, double digit debt. Don't worry about anything else. Don't read articles about stocks. Don't waste your time until you spend the time managing your money. Take the five minutes every day to log into your Mint account, figure out where your money went, label it, right? Like track it, uh, do some categories, anything. Then figure out how you're going to make more, right? Like if you can't, if you, if you're spending like what you need, you know, 
figure out how to make more. Like that's where you should spend your time instead of investing. Um, if you have long-term loans, um, so, you know, obviously there's student loans, maybe mortgage, maybe car loan, do like assess it. And obviously a lot of long-term loans, especially because we're in a very low interest rate environment, um, are, the interest rates aren't horrible, but you really need to figure out like how it's going to still impact your cash flow, right? Because you're paying off, these payments are due every month, incorporate into cash flow management. And then assess your other liabilities. So people think liabilities, they think loans, they think things that are obligated to repay. But your liabilities are also things you sign up for. Like um, if you rent, like what you pick, where you pick to live, and how big of a place you pick, and whether or not you have roommates, that's a liability. Signing up to pay that rent. Uh, if you own a car, um, pets, you know, I had pets. Pets are liabilities. Like these are things that you're going to be responsible for in terms of your cash flow. So just be aware and assess how you're treating those liabilities, how you make those choices. And then after you, you do these couple of things, add an expense, expense line. After you get your like budget and where, and budgets like, I don't know, some people like don't like budget. They think it's limiting. I just think like expenditures, like be realistic, be truthful with yourself about the money that you're spending and then add an expense line to it for the investing because you need to start incorporating it into your like into your monthly outflow don't think of investing as a one-time thing or like i gotta get this big stash of money then i'll invest start incorporating it as an expense line item then of course the very first step we're going to move to the next stage is uh to flex your tax favored accounts muscles if you've ever joined me before you've heard me talk about the big five money topics and now we'll talk, go through them again right now because they don't change. Those are the five things that will impact your ability to build wealth over your lifetime. Income's number one. Income. You've got to generate income. You are your biggest asset. You are your biggest revenue generating asset. You and your skill set and how you value yourself in the world and your willingness to take your skill sets and put them out in the market, whether you get a job or whether you're self-employed. Uh, taxation is the number one and there's a con there is a that's why we're going to be talking about taxation of stage two well it's stage zero pre-investing is really stage zero stage one of becoming an investor has a lot to do with understanding taxation and tax favored accounts number three is going to be investing and we're talking about it uh because you can't really you you it's really hard to build wealth that's sustainable over, over a long period of time if you don't understand and you don't become an investor. Because if you just keep a bunch of cash, it actually loses its purchasing power and uh, due to inflation. So uh, number three is investing. And then number four and five, number four is big purchases. Before you make a big purchase in your life, you need to really think about the impact it'll have on your ability to build wealth. That's a trade-off. And then number five is risk. If you don't mitigate risks uh, in terms of like having health insurance or, or maybe having you know, other kinds of insurances or just thinking about how you're going to deal with it, then you're going to have a really hard time. Okay, so we covered the pre-investing stage and now we're going to cover stage one of becoming an investor. All right, how can I break it down to you? Keep it simple. When you're first becoming an investor, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for saying that. I do um, appreciate it. And uh, I mean, that's why I'm here, right? Like I'm trying to get people, like I want everyone to join me, <laughs> like join me. Um, I'm tired of people like not being able to meet me for lunch because they have to work. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I really, I just want more people to be able to spend time together and connect because that's ultimately what makes us human. So I'm trying to do it through the best way I know how, which is to help you figure out how to keep more money and then grow it and then become financially free. Okay, so becoming an investor, keeping it simple and keeping it tax-free. I cannot emphasize it enough. Before you go and get excited and take your $100 and buy some, you know, a few shares of some stock, don't. <laughs> um, go, like, boring works. you got to open an IRA or use your 401k of work. And we're going to talk about self-employed 401ks because I was researching it for this talk and I'm like even more excited about them now than I've ever been. Um, so pick your poison, I say. Pick your one of your tax-deferred accounts or tax-free accounts, IRA or 401k. Why? Because you're in the very stage of investing, which means you just came out of the pre-investing stage. So you just got your cash flow and debt under control. So don't like get all fancy, right? You got to pick the IRA or 401k and then 
pick the traditional because why you're cash flow challenged, right? Let's call you cash flow challenged. So the more you can take advantage of tax taxes and tax advantage account and tax deduction, the better position you'll be. The next thing is that what you should be aiming for is not what everybody else is telling you. Don't go 3%, don't go 4%, don't go match. If I hear someone saying once again that, oh, my company doesn't do a match for 401k, so I'm not participating, I will like, I will strangle somebody. Um, try to max out your 401k. I cannot emphasize this enough. Like you've got to basically figure out what's it going to take for you to max it out. If you have it for 1k and we'll talk to the self-employed for 1k that's even more fun your goal in life should be to like pay the least tax legally and the way you do it is you max out your tax deductible accounts and you go oh my god i just came out of like being cash flow challenged how about you do it well challenge yourself to to do better get an ex get a side gig right like read a book about making like 500 dollars extra a month or something um, babysitting, like Uber, like today more than ever, there is more available side income ability. And if you have a skill, sell it. If you have time, sell it. You got to figure out how to do it, right? But once you decide that that's what you're going to do, so if you're going to do an IRA, you know, because maybe you don't have a 401k and that's an easy thing for you to start, $5,500 is the amount you're trying to save every year. Right, that's your first goal. 401k, $18,000. $18,000. That's your goal. Don't do 3%. Uh, so, depends the type of debt. That, that really does. So, depends the type of debt and your future income prospect. It gets a little more complicated, like when you're just like marginal. So, if you debt, if you pay off, so credit card debt, buckle down, pay it off, never have any more again. If you have other debt, like mortgage or student loans, and it's 6%, 8%, 3%, um, keep that debt. Like, don't worry about paying it off before you invest. Uh, credit card debt, car loans, and student loans. Credit card debt, get rid of that. Make sure it's automated, full, and pay. Like, get your spending under control. Car loans are likely a low percentage, and student loans, keep those. Don't worry about paying them off. Invest first. So it's kind of like, it's a little counterintuitive, right? And... And it's almost like if you're real close to paying your credit card debt off and you need to sign up for something, like sign up for it. Um, because if you sign up for your 401k and you try to max it out, what's going to happen is that your your tax bill now changes. And what, the way I talked about it before is if you're going to be if you've been getting a, t a big tax refund in your tax in your tax situation, your employment situation hasn't changed. Um, so if you like you one W2 or both W2 workers and you have been considering Consistently getting a tax refund, up your W-4 while you're uh, while you're increasing your 401a contribution. So what do, you, what do I mean by up your W-4? W-4 is the form on which you indicate how many exemptions that you're going to claim. That's a, basically an estimate for your employer to figure out how much taxes to withhold. And most people like we're way too conservative when it comes to it. They put the like the lowest number possible. They're like, oh, it's me, myself, and my two children, so I'm going to put four. And then they end up getting $5,000 back in taxes for every, like, the rule of thumb. And again, the higher tax bracket you are, the less applicable it is. But let's say if you're 25% tax bracket, and you add an extra exemption that's going to lower your tax refund by $1,000, it's going to give you a little bit every paycheck, right? So, so if you're having cash flow issues, like do think through it and say, like there's going to be a change. That's why I say pay off your credit card first and then figure out like how to spend less um, because that's going to really like make sure you have a difference. But I would say then start contributing to for your 401k um, because it's going to actually like get you more disciplined because maybe your paycheck is going to be a little bit smaller because it's going towards 401k, but it's not that much smaller, right? Because you're saving on taxes, right? It's a more complicated equation. And actually I was going through that because I'm trying to get people to understand that. So that's the best I can do. And if you want to talk, like, seriously, if you, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about your particular situation, I'm happy to like jump on Skype and like go through and do my little like uh, cash flowing thing and say, look, I think this is the right way. So I'm talking in generalities right now. Uh, but I think that that's the right way to go. Okay. 
and uh, and traditional first because I do think that people um, people that get very wa- like they start waffling around like well you know shouldn't it be a Roth IRA uh, you know a Roth for long term if your cash flow challenge yeah no let's let's do that um, hit me up on Twitter I know you follow me on Twitter why don't you send me a message on Twitter and then we can set something up um, and so. Put uh, so don't get fancy with Roth. Uh, this is the advanced option for advanced only. This is when I would say when you're first starting out and you are an investor, yeah, no problem. Uh, and you get and you say, well, should I do a Roth? Okay. So if you're like a person early on and you're like, oh, I should do a Roth because you're a money nerd. I mean, by all means, right? Like if you're planning for longevity, you're thinking through intergenerational wealth, you're thinking on income upside in the future, and you just want to be clever, you know, as long as you're within the income limitations, by all means, do a Roth IRA. Better yet, do a Roth 401k. And and that's where the Roth advantage comes in if you're self-employed. Now, I think that everyone should aim to be self-employed. And I don't mean just like full-time self-employed necessarily. I'm saying that everyone should have some self-employment income. Why? Because there's magic in that tax code for self-employed people. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, so you may have a full-time job, but get your side hustle on, right? Get your side hustle on, do an Amazon affiliate, like whatever it is. Like try to make $5 side income. Hell, try to make 50 Then try to make 500 right? At some point... Um, no matter what, you don't have to be fully self-employed for the government to give you the privileges that come with self-employed income. And this is where, um, like, and I'll talk about this is like, it's, it seems like it's getting advanced, but it's not because I want you, if you are fully self-employed, if you're a freelancer or a contractor or, you know, uh, unemployed in between, consultant, whatever the euphemism is, um, but if you have income that comes on a 1099 form, uh, or, you know, you receive invoices and revenue and invoices, and you don't have employees. So this is for solopreneurs. And again, I encourage everyone to be a solopreneur in some aspect of their life. This is like huge for wealth building. And why? Because the individual 401k is one of the biggest, um, I don't want to call it a tax racket because that sounds like bad, but it's like, it's an amazing tax protection for your asset accumulation. It's only been around since 2001, uh, so only 15 years. So sometimes when you go to like a stodgy uh, financial advising place, they'll be like, you can have a SEP IRA. And I'm like, hell no, individual 401k is always the way to go. Like every mathematical equation, every flexibility thing, that is the way to go. So if you have any side income, what you really should be looking for is not for it to pay for your Caribbean vacation, but for it to fund your individual 401k. So. Um, that is a huge, huge thing. So get yourself some side income. Anyone can be self-employed and your employee contribution starts at dollar one. Now, if you have a, a 401k from work and this individual 401k, you still are limited to only $18,000 in contributions. So, uh, to the, to the employee deferral. The, the uh, so you just have to do a little bit of math or a little bit thinking. But that's what we're here for. We're here to do thinking and doing a little bit, a little bit of math. Um, so, uh, you know, but again, keep it simple. So, again, if you don't have an individual 401k through work, I mean, if you don't have a 401k plan through work, I think individual uh, 401k is the way to go. And you can open one through Vanguard. I always recommend Vanguard. Why? Because they're low cost. I like to pay the least amount of money for my investments. So, um those are, the, those are the becoming an investor. So you're in stage one of becoming an investor when you officially have opened some account. Again, my recommendation is tax deferred, and then you put your money in mutual fund. Look for, if you're, if you're through work, and it says Vanguard and or says index, that's your, that's your first ones to go. Look at the cost, like, you know, but getting started is more important than just about anything else. Because when do you move to the next stage of being an investor? Okay. Um, you're actually going to be in that first stage for a lot, for a while. Stage two. I really don't think you're ready for stage two till you get to uh, a six-figure net worth. Whoa. Whoa. Did I just say six figures? So you're 100000 there, right? And so, And so you might be like, 
And it may be not exactly net worth because you may have student loans. Some people student loans, man, they're they're crazy. They're like a lot, right? So maybe you're not your net worth's not six figures, but maybe your investable assets, which includes your like 401k. So look at your how much assets do you have? And so <laughs> oh thank you. And so um when but that's kind of next stage because here's my point. Don't worry about the things that are not applicable until you get to the next stage, right? Right? Like, don't worry about it. Like, forget it. Don't, don't listen to it. Like, tune it out. You know, like pre, pre-investment, all you need to focus on is cash flow debt repayment. Investor stage one and just like, like, like kind of like blinders on, be like IRA, 401k, tax-free, tax-free, right? And then when you get to the six-figure net worth, then you go, okay, I'm going to look around. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, I don't usually wear glasses, but February has been glasses wearing month. So um, when um, so when you get to the six figure net worth or your total accounts are six figures and you've got to reflect. Um, I'm talking about money and investing specifically. I like to talk about money and trying to teach other people what I know about money and how to build wealth um, over time, like over a decade or two decades. Um, so now I'm talking about investing. Uh, so when you get to six-figure net worth, and it's a why six figures, right? Because, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, I make 10 kids. <laughs> yeah, I, two kids is enough. Uh, kids are expensive. Um, so six, um, so why six figures? Because I let them work. Um, I want them to, you know, I'm a yuppie parent. I want them to like be happy and discover themselves. Um, why six figures? Okay. Because that's a symbolic, um, for me, they are because you have to prove to yourself and to the world that you have the discipline, right? And the long-term dedication and the fiscal prowess to actually build wealth, right? So that's when, like, when you're at stage two of investing, that's where, you know, that's when I think you need to start becoming more interested and curious about investing. And I don't think that you need to necessarily change what you're doing. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, that's not been my that's not been a strategy i've I've used before it's interesting and so um it, you know so don't do anything crazy um so you don't have to talk about money it's all right I actually like talking about money and um so that's when I wouldn't do anything um anything crazy but maybe like expand like what you're doing so if you've been investing in a single uh, mutual fund like look at others right start understanding the global market start understanding start understanding international stocks uh, so start paying more attention to the money you've already have invested and then uh, you know by that time here's the other thing right like if you've been doing the side income, if you've been doing uh, the other things, it should give you a little bit of confidence to, um, it should give you more confidence to get you into, in the mindset of like, hey, you know, I can do this. Like there is actually a path forward for me to build wealth, right? And so that's when you start looking around and saying, okay, what else am I applying myself? You know, am I giving myself to the market with enough value? What's my like loan repayment? What's my, uh, like the risk management, right? All of those things. Um, but I do think that you're not doing a lot of things differently. Even if you get to the six figure net worth, um, you're mitigating some risks, you're continuing it. Uh, you're continuing the practices that you are, that you've established, right? Right? And then until you get to the, the mid six figures net worth. And I do think that that's when you start really thinking through about taxes long term. Right. And so this is why, you know, I say don't really get, don't worry about things that you're not, that don't, that don't concern you uh, when, before you got to that point. So the mid six figures, what do I mean by the mid six figure? Like two hundred fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. And again, people go like, oh, it's so much money. And you're like, no, that's an that's investing. In investing, that's not a ton of money, right? Like the returns out of that won't be huge. It won't take you through the retirement. It's not your financial freedom. But it shows me something, right? It shows me that you followed the right path and advice and then you have discipline. So that's when you go, okay, let me really think through my tax strategy. Am I tax diversified? 
justified? What funds am I in? Are they low cost, right? Now you start evaluating all those decisions that you've made because what you've really been doing is building your contribution. And you're like, am I maximizing my accounts? Am I doing like all I can? Do I have a health savings account, right? Like, again, you don't get fancy. You just expand your reach. Uh, now you're actually trying to pay attention to the rate of return, right? Are you all in equity? Um, are you, um, you know, are your, are your funds that you've chosen, are they performing well, uh, right? So start evaluating, maybe start even moving money. And I don't mean moving like uh, taking it out, but like within your funds going, okay, you know, I need to diversify. And you may also think about diversifying beyond stocks. So some people really love real estate. I don't, I don't understand it and I think it takes a lot of work. And, but there are people who made a lot of money in real estate. So you may want to look at real estate investing. You may want to learn about startup investing, right? Angel investing. Uh, I do lending club, right? So do alternative, um, do some diversification. And even within the stocks, you know, do you have some bonds? Uh, you know, or do you have enough money like in your Vanguard account to get some special services? Are you lowering your fees? So those are the things that you start thinking about in mid six figures. And again, I don't want you to really worry about it till you get there. And then, uh, you know, finally, like when you get to seven figure net worth, because eventually you will, here's my point. If you do these things, if you do these things consistently, you will get to seven figure net worth. You, oh, you will. It's just math. <laughs> it's just math. And uh, here's what happens when you get to seven figure net worth, because you will eventually. Uh, it's like a decade or two. Uh, if you're making good, if you're making decent six figure income and you can become disciplined and pull yourself away from consumerism, you can get there in a decade. If you either five, uh, five figures on your way to six figures, or you've kind of saddled yourself with a lot of liabilities, not just the debt, but the lifestyle, it would take you two decades. But if you do the things I say, if you take all of these things seriously, your income sources, uh, your taxation and investing, you will get there. But when, once you get there, what do you do? Well, first you congratulate yourself. Uh, because you will be like in the top 1%, uh, not, not necessarily like if you're close to retirement age, oh, there's a, quite a few people who have accumulated seven figures when they're close to retirement age, but people who aren't yet close to retirement age, that's, that's rare. Like, and that's the other thing that always pisses me off about personal finance and retirement articles. They like talk about, they like try to make it realistic and they're like, you know, when you get to $160,000, and I'm like, what? You know, like, get like, you know, get there faster. Like, I, I just, I want people to get there faster because I think you can, right? Like, don't set such low expectations. I don't know. I always try to set the highest expectations for myself. Like, like if I'm going to do something, I'm just going to get it done, right? If you're serious about wealth building, don't put $200 away. Like, think about how are you going to get to, to maxing it out, right? That's like, again, be tax efficient. Don't just, don't just hoard money, but be like, hey, you know, I can, I can take advantage of this tax deferred account. Do it. And then all you really got to start thinking about is taxes. Why do you think, why do you think I talk about taxes like, like a mad person? Because like it occurred to me at some point, especially with, um, with the individual 401k, how much, and I'm, I did some calculations before I got on here, how much that matters, like how much that's going to matter and how big of a difference it makes. Because here's what, what, how you need to start thinking about uh, taxation and tax, uh, tax deferred uh, accounts and tax deductions is that it's like the government by reducing your taxes is contributing to your wealth building. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that idea of someone else helping me build my wealth. And that is exactly what the government, the federal and state governments are doing when you do that, when you take advantage of the tax, uh, of the, of the tax code in that way, you're, you're, you're getting rewarded. You're getting rewarded for pursuing it. And